Hey all, here OS Reviews. Recently we did a revisited review on the Surface Laptop and I enjoyed it. I thought it offered pretty good price to performance ratio now that it's in the budget territory. So I also want to take a look at a more conventional tablet form factor Surface and see how it stacks up. So today we're doing a revisited look at the Surface Pro 3 here in 2023. This is a convertible that came out in 2014, making it now almost nine years old. Again, time really does fly, but I argue that the Surface Pro 3 was one of the first times when Microsoft cracked the code on the more modern Surface form factor by putting this 3 by 4 aspect ratio screen. You're able to see more at a glance and not have to scroll quite as much, similar to a book in terms of the form. Otherwise, it was more powerful in addition to being lighter than the predecessor Surface Pro 2, that one being almost 2 pounds versus this one which is 1.7 pounds, plus that display which is sharper as well. This one is 2K versus 1080p on the previous generation model. Now in terms of pricing, because this thing is a little older than the Surface Laptop 2 that we saw before, it's also a touch cheaper. You can find it for under $100 when you're shopping around, sometimes as low as 80. So it's definitely in the extremely affordable category. And as reference, the next generation Surface Pro 4, actually can be found for around $150 to $200. So it's almost twice the price of this thing, but of course you are getting a newer processor as well. Which speaking of, there are various configurations for Surface products as usual. The base model comes with the Core i3, but it can also go up to a Core i7. We'll talk about that later on. And in terms of RAM, there were four or eight gigabyte configurations. I'd argue that if you're buying it today, you would really want to look at the i5 with eight gigabyte of RAM version as a baseline, since that will provide you with a more responsive experience, especially for multitasking, since four gigs is just a little too low for Windows these days. Storage options can also be found for 64, 128, or 256 gigabytes. Since it's not going to be replaceable, I would really urge you to look at the 128, if not 256 versions, because again, Windows and software in general these days just takes up more room. 64 is just really too low. So we have again, a convertible form factor, which is well known in the Surface line, so you can easily detach it from the type cover, which was and still is sold separately on Surface products, unfortunately. But you can now find these things very cheap, and the benefit is they're all backwards compatible with each other, including some of the original generation type covers, plus the later ones, like the one used on the Surface Pro 4, which is significantly better by having a glass touchpad. So that would be the one I'd recommend picking up, but they're all relatively slim, and and one, of course, slight downside of surfaces in general compared to a conventional laptop is it relies on this kickstand for propping itself up. It's a pretty cool form and it's easy to adjust in terms of the angles that you can position this thing that starting with the Surface Pro 3 offer you almost unlimited degrees of movement. With that being said, it does require a little bit more space, a couple of extra inches. So you need to have a table that's gonna be a little deeper and bigger as a result and lap ability, that is if you're just working working on your lap is not going to be quite as strong and sturdy as a conventional laptop. And that's where, again, that Surface Laptop comes into play. But if you want something that can be used in multiple ways, you really cherish this tablet form, that's where having this two-in-one can be beneficial. Nonetheless, like most Surface products, it is very well constructed. This one being made out of magnesium alloy, it's actually quite lightweight for a tablet of its size. It's not quite as cold as aluminum, or maybe that's just the paint that Microsoft put onto the surface. It's a little bit more inviting when you're picking it up, but still feels quite premium and solid. Now, of course, on the side here, we have access to the volume rocker, 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. There is a five megapixel camera on the rear, some microphones, and all the vents here for the fans and cooling are located on the edges. The top houses the power key for turning the unit on and off. And then on the left-hand spine, there's access to a mini display port for connecting up to 4K external monitors and also a full-size USB Type-A port. Plus there's the magnetic surface charging port as well. If you accidentally tug the table, the tablet is not gonna go flying with it. Now on the 
kickstand part, if I actually pop it back, you'll also find access to a micro SD slot as well. So in terms of I.O., this thing is really not bad. You can also see some of the Microsoft branding down below there as well, and some of the kind of parts or joints really for that hinge, which is now part of the identity of most Surface products. Of course, it also is compatible with Surface pens for really Microsoft pen protocol devices, and you're able to annotate, draw with pressure sensitivity on the touchscreen, adding to the versatility of this setup. And there is a 5 megapixel camera on the top for video conferencing. There's also a Windows key that you can touch on, which can pull up the program store here on the side. It also works quite well, something that was later removed on newer surfaces to make the bezels even slimmer, as well as adding in the face unlock or Windows hello functionality starting with the next gen. Otherwise, again, very good panel with wide viewing angles, excellent brightness, and the sharpness and resolution I think are all still quite good. And as of 2023, all Surface tablets are still using IPS LCD, so there is no OLED option either, so you're not really losing out on that part. Again, for students, if you're using it for note-taking, it can feel very seamless because you can press lightly to get a very light line versus harder to get a firmer line, and it does feel like a pretty natural inking experience. We can argue that certain e-ink-based note-taking devices, whether it's Describe or Remarkable, are starting to compete with that a little bit, but the Surface is definitely no slouch, and especially if you're looking for a more powerful computer with a color display, this can still offer you more flexibility, especially when it comes to doing a bit of creative work, like sketching, doodling, and drawing in general. Speaking of, in terms of power and also battery life, that's one thing to note if you're picking up an older computer or tech in general, there will be some degree of battery degradation. This thing came originally with a 42 watt hour cell that was originally lasting just shy of 10 hours. These days, a used model will generally get you around 4 to 5 hours of moderate usage, so it's not going to be the longest lasting machine in the world, but still serviceable if you have an outlet that is relatively close by or a power bank. One thing that is worth mentioning though is repairability on a lot of these Surface tablet form factors are a lot harder compared to a conventional laptop where you can just pop it open, even swap out the SSD versus this being mostly soldered in and kind of glued together until some of the newer gen models. But even then on a tablet in general, it's gonna be harder to repair for the average consumer versus a laptop. It comes at the trade-off of having something which is lighter, more beautiful to carry. You can also choose between either battery optimization mode or going into a turbo mode, which will crank up the CPU, but also draw more power. Even on an optimized mode, it's generally still quite serviceable, I have to admit. And the Wi-Fi reception speeds are also really not shabby with a dual band 2.4 and 5G connectivity, although Wi-Fi 6 is of course not supported and there is no cellular model. But as you can tell here, it still is surprisingly snappy for a machine that is now almost a decade old. And I think this hardware here has held up a little better than I was expecting. Even even on more complex pages with some videos and ads, it still is loading back quite fast. Granted, once you start opening up, let's say, more than six tabs or so, it gets a little bit more boggled down, but with general usage, it still seems to be actually quite reasonable. So for lighter usage, including just some browsing and research, document editing, I think it's actually an area where this laptop can surprisingly still hold up and do a pretty good job in. Some takeaways being that the speaker quality is also really not shabby. For a tablet, that is, they are front-facing and it's stereo located on the left and the right sides of the panel. And the overall YouTube streaming experience has also held up quite well. Intel HD graphics on this thing are not powerful by any means if you are pressing it harder, but for just video consumption, it is surprisingly still quite fast to load and doing a pretty good job, as you can see here, for just streaming back this video clip without much waiting, even though we are playing right now at a full HD resolution. Now, if we do crank it up to something like 2K, you'll notice some occasional moments of choppiness when loading back, but still very reasonable. So far, zero drop frames, in fact, and we're not even at the fastest performance mode in this test. So if you are just purchasing this for watching back YouTube videos and Netflix, well, that's something that I can still handle quite well. Now, I do hear just a touch of the fan kicking in now after you stream for more than, say, 20 minutes or so, but still really not bad. I don't really notice any thermal throttling. 
Although synthetic benchmarks aren't everything, let's take a quick look also at how it sits compared to some of the other models. And for reference, I'm just going to look at the middle of the road version with the Core i5, since yes, there is also an i3 model. Similarly, in the Surface Pro 4, you can also find a Core M3 model as well. But the mid-range model was the most popular, and so when you're shopping around, it's also the one that you'll most typically stumble across. Anyways, this processor here is a dual core one with a quad thread architecture and scores 2500 on Passmark. So this is not a very powerful chip by any means here in 2023. In fact, it's really just a touch stronger than some of the entry-level Intel Celerons and Pentiums that are newer on the market today. But it's also because this processor back then was also a little bit more of an energy efficient one chosen by Microsoft to again fit into a tablet form. What's also kind of surprising is on all of the Surface Pro units, at least in the two or three generations apart, they're all not too far off from one another in terms of raw horsepower, at least on synthetic benchmarks. For example, the Surface Pro 4 bumps that up to a i5-6300U, slightly higher clock speed, but still a dual-core architecture, and then further bumping it up to the Surface Pro 5. We're also talking about a dual core chip. This one here is the i5-7300U, is now a little bit north of 3600 on the Passmark score. And ultimately, I would say optimization is also a big part of the puzzle, because even though the score on paper here doesn't seem all that impressive, again, for light computing, I'd argue that it's actually sufficient, since web browsing still seems speedy enough, probably also thanks again to the fast Wi-Fi reception, plus the usage of a pretty fast SSD also keeps things, again, relatively relatively speedy from a read and write perspective as you're opening apps and opening files and navigating around the UI. So really not bad, I have to say. And like other devices that we've seen, lighter tasks such as word and document editing, emails, don't pose an issue on this machine either. As far as gaming is concerned, this is where, of course, an older machine, integrated Intel graphics, it's not going to provide you the best experience. But for older titles like Rocket League, Counter-Strike, as well as retro emulators, they will still run here without too many issues, I'd say. Services like xCloud and Amazon's Luna will provide you with a better experience using more powerful hardware over the cloud as long as you have a good enough internet connection. And those themes are mostly carried over to some creative work as well, where Photoshop, surprisingly, can be handled here without too many issues, especially with the touchscreen, it is quite convenient. Although if you're doing video editing, it's just not gonna be the best experience. Full HD clips can be exported, so if you have maybe a five minute clip, it usually takes around six to seven minutes. So definitely not the fastest, but it's still doable. But 4K clips, anything higher res, and it's gonna struggle a lot more. So that is more or less it as far as our revisited kind of retro review of the Surface Pro 3 here in 2023, and this thing has overall held up better than I was expecting. And that is, again, if you are looking for a 2-in-1 detachable form factor device, as opposed to a conventional laptop, or again, something very light for those office and browsing needs. You can check out additional details if you're interested in the links down below, but for now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been our look back at the Surface Pro 3.